In this lecture, we're going to look at the colour of transition metal complexes. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to explain why transition metal complexes are often coloured, explain how different ligands can affect the colour in transition metal complexes. You should be able to use electronic configurations to predict which transition metals are coloured and which are colourless. And finally, you should be able to use a colour wheel to predict the colour of a transition metal complex given either wavelength or the colour of the light it absorbs. Unlike most metal compounds, transition metal compounds are very often coloured. Here we see the blue copper sulphate and the blue colour is caused by the copper ions. This is potassium dichromate and the orange colour is due to the chromate ions. And this is potassium permanganate, the purple colour being due to the manganate ions. So the first thing I want to do today is to explain why transition metal compounds are often coloured. Right, here's a sample of copper sulphate with its distinctive blue colour. I'm sure you've seen it many times before. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to drive off all the water absorbed to it uh, using a Vincent burner and let's look to see what changes occur. So I put the Bunsen burner underneath it and we'll just watch it for a minute or two to see what happens as all the water is removed. Having driven off all the water, you can see that the copper sulphate is actually white or colourless and it's not actually blue. But I want to show you what happens when I now introduce some water back into the complex. So you can see that as soon as I add water again, we get our blue colour back. So what this demonstrates is that it's not actually the copper ions that are blue, but it's the copper ions water complex that is blue. And this is the case for all transition metal complexes. It's not actually transition metal itself which is coloured, but it's a transition metal complex. So why are transition metal complexes often coloured? Well, let's continue using the Cu2 plus ion as an, exam as an example. And if we look at the electronic configuration of the copper atom, it's 3d10 4s1. When it forms the Cu2 plus ion, it loses the 4s1 electron, and it loses one of the 3d10 electrons. So it becomes argon. 3d9. So it's got nine electrons in its five degenerate d orbitals. So let's mark them in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Right, when we introduce the water as a ligand, the, ligand, the water ligands affect these d orbitals in different ways. Some of the d orbitals are raised to a higher energy and some are lowered to a lower energy. So the d orbitals are split. We say that the ligands make the d orbitals lose their degeneracy. Remember, degenerate orbitals all have the same energy. But once you introduce the ligand, all five d orbitals do not have the same energy. So let's put in our nine electrons again. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. Now, when light interacts with this complex, 
the complex can absorb light corresponding to this energy difference by promoting an electron from here into this gap here. For the copper water complex, this energy difference corresponds to light of a wavelength of 620 nanometers, which is in the visible region. Remember, the visible region goes from 400 to 700. So the copper water complex absorbs light with a wavelength of 620 nanometers. If you look at the colour wheel, which you'll find on page 20 of your data booklet, you'll find that the wavelength of 620 nanometers corresponds to the orange section of the colour wheel. Now, if the complex is absorbing the orange light, what we see is a complementary colour, which is the colour opposite it in the colour wheel. So the colour opposite orange in the colour wheel here is blue. So that's why the copper uh, water complex is blue in colour. If we used a different ligand instead of water, then that can cause the d orbitals to be split by a different amount. This list here is known as the spectrochemical series and gives you an indication of how much any one ligand will split the d orbitals. So we've got a water here. So this shows you that the halide ions down here, they split the d orbitals to a smaller amount than the water. So that means the complex would absorb a lower energy of radiation, which means a longer wavelength of radiation. So the halide ion complexes are more likely to absorb red light, which is of a lower energy and a higher wavelength. So if it's absorbing red light, they are more likely to produce greenish compounds. And according to the spectrochemical series, the cyanoion is the one that splits the d orbitals the greatest amount. So the cyanoion would cause the complex to absorb high energy light which is low wavelength, which should be blue. So in that case, we'd be absorbing blue light and our complex would appear orange, like the potassium dichromate I showed you in the very first slide. Now, you're pleased to know you don't have to actually learn this spectrochemical series. You just need to be aware that different ligands will split the d orbitals by different amounts. So to summarise, the colour of transition metal complexes derive from the loss of degeneracy in the three d orbitals caused by the interaction of these d orbitals with the ligands. The complex will then absorb energy corresponding to this difference here. This is sometimes known as a crystal field strength. So it will absorb the light of the wavelength corresponding to that energy and you observe the complementary colour. The crystal field strength or the size of the splitting will vary depending on what transition metal ion you're using and also what ligand. Just one final word of warning, for this to happen of course, the transition metal ion has to have a partially filled d orbital. If we look at the copper 1 plus ion, if you remember copper was argon 3d10 4s1, the copper 1 plus ion have an electron arrangement of argon 3d10. So it's got 10 d orbitals, oh, sorry, it's got 10 electrons in the d orbitals. So the d orbitals are full, so there's no space up here for an electron to be promoted. <laughs>
So the copper one plus ion would not be a colourful transition metal ion complex. And similarly, if you had something like the scandium three plus, that would have a transition, that would have an electron configuration of Br. It had lost all its 3d orbitals. So if you hadn't got any 3d orbitals, sorry, hadn't got any electrons in your 3d orbitals, there's no electrons to be promoted. So it's essential that you check the transition metal ion has a partially filled 3d orbital in order for it to become a coloured complex. Okay, by now you should be able to explain why transition metal complexes are often coloured, how different ligands can affect the colour in transition metal complexes. You should be able to use electronic configurations to predict which transition metals are coloured and which are colourless. And you should be able to use a colour wheel to predict the colour of a transition metal complex given either wavelength or the colour of the light absorbed by the complex.